this is what my uh, passion is, and this is what I'm going to be working in, whatever it's going to be called. And I said, well, I'm thinking English. He looked at me, he said, English? <laughs> English? He said, he said, what about Hawaiian? And I said, Hawaiian? There were no schools teaching Hawaiian. So I went and declared a second major for Hawaiian language. And the counselor laughed out loud. He says, you know, for what? You know, and what do you think you'd do with it? And you're not Hawaiian anyway. You know, why would you? I said, well, I'm interested. And that's really all I was, was I was just interested. I worked in the Hawaiian Language Center at UH Hilo. And having those venues where you can actually apply your language learning instead of just keeping it confined to 50 minutes a day as a language course, I think that's what really helped me acquire my fluency. By the 1960s, the Hawaiian language was scarcely heard in Hawaii, mostly when elders talked to each other. Today, Olalo Hawaii is thriving. Children are speaking it. Next on Long Story Short, we revisit conversations with some of our guests whose passion for the language led to its resurgence. One-on-one, -on -one, engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Hawaiian language can be heard in conversation in many places in Hawaii, in airports, on football fields, on television. It's not just a few words here and there, people are speaking Hawaiian. Yet 50 years ago, Hawaiian language was on the verge of extinction. Previous generations had been admonished against speaking Hawaiian, and the only people left speaking it were kupuna who had refused to give up their native tongue. Over the years, we've had guests on this program who've dedicated their lives to perpetuating the Hawaiian language. For Larry Kimura, Sarah Keahi, and Puakea Nogelmeyer, their interests started back in the 1960s and 70s when they were captivated by kupuna who spoke the language. It was the beginning of the Hawaiian Renaissance when young Hawaiians were starting to realize that if they didn't start practicing their culture, it would be lost forever. A generation later, Amy Kalili took the revival of the language a step further by hosting a first ever Hawaiian language segment in a local TV news program. We start with our 2016 conversation with Larry Lindsay Kimura, who used to listen to his Hawaiian grandmother speak to her friends in Hawaiian. When he went to Kamehameha schools in the eighth grade as a boarding student from Waimea in North Hawaii Island, he took a Hawaiian language class that he says he almost flunked because it didn't sound like his grandmother's Hawaiian. In high school, he had another opportunity to take a Hawaiian language class. Colonel Kent, the president of the boys' school, I didn't know was interested in Hawaiian and he convinced us person who is a native speaker of Hawaiian. She had just retired teaching her whole life in Hawaiian music. That is Dorothy Kahn Anui. She retired from the university. She, he convinced her to come in my sophomore year and she was to teach Hawaiian she's never taught before and write a textbook for high school, a textbook to teach Hawaiian. And she was there just for those three years I was there. And I happened to have a free homeroom period when she came enrolled in the class and just loved it. And that's how I got to be uh, trained enough to speak it to my grandmother when I got home during the summer breaks that we, we went home, you know. What did your grandmother that. say when you came home speaking? I was kind, of course I was a bit hesitant and frightened what she would, her response would be. But luckily I had been writing to her in Hawaiian, in letters and she responded. And so she had this idea about my becoming, well, she thought I was just becoming interested in Hawaiian then, but actually I was interested in way before. And uh, so actually it was very, it felt very um, comfortable using Hawaiian. And with my grand uncles and grand aunts, at the, you know, that group of people back home, they, um, they were not critical at all. They were very supportive. So I was lucky. Maybe Mrs. Kananui taught me well enough, so. So you were loving Hawaiian at Kamehameha, talking with your Hawaiian grandmother in Hawaiian, but you still didn't see how this would be of benefit to you in a profession. There was no such job that you knew of, right? To, to move along to. No, 
I was just, uh, you know, engaging in as much as I could to learn as much as I could. And was that there anybody was the else around you who point. wanted to do this? No. Buddies of yours? No. Everybody thought it was a crazy thing. I'm sure I, I had, I just didn't want to discuss. I didn't know how to talk about my interests with anyone because at that time, people would probably think I was crazy. And even what your grandmother didn't know how interested you were. No, she didn't know until she saw the letters that I wrote when I was in the 10th grade. 11th grade so, when I was taking home. So just a, a personal consuming interest that you kept to yourself mostly. Yes. It was on to uh, UH? Well, I didn't know, you know, counselors at Kamehameha didn't counsel you to go into Hawaiian actually back then. There was no place to go, first of all. Mm -hmm. So the only thing left for me to do was to stay at home, which I did. And I went to the two year college at, the, at Hilo. But then it was only a two-year university campus, mm -hmm. and then you finished up here at Manoa. So when I was in Hilo, luckily, you know, that gave me the opportunity to continue uh, meeting up with my grandparent generation, my grandmother and my aunts and uncles on weekends, and they were my teachers that helped me to become more fluent. And I, I was brave enough to begin to try and record um, some of our uh, speakers of the language, older people, yeah. And in fact, when my, it, I saw that when Mrs. Connor Nui brought this tape recorder, this huge seven inch tape recorder to class and played this Bishop Museum recording of an interview of a native speaker with Mrs. Pukui. And I said, when my grandmother comes for my uh, graduation, I'd love for her to be recorded. Like this person was recorded by Mrs. Pukui. You think Mrs. Pukui will do it? Oh, I'm sure she would. Why don't you just, well, I think we could ask her. So I did, I just found out where she lived and introduced myself and I said, in Hawaiian, my grandmother is coming. Would you interview her? She said, of course I would. Wow, that was a big step forward. She yeah. was a, the reigning authority. So that gave me, um, you know, this whole interest in uh, understanding the value of trying to record as many of these people as we could. And what did they think of you trying to record them? They probably thought I was pretty weird to be interested <laughs> in what they would want to tell me <laughs> in Hawaiian. And so they were pleased to have mm. somebody to actually take an interest in what they knew. Larry Kimura went on to become a co-founder of Aha Punana Leo Hawaiian Language Immersion Schools, and as of 2020, had been teaching Hawaiian language for more than 45 years. Our next guest, Sarah Patricia Ilialoha Kwaifa Ayat Keahi, is better remembered by her students as Mrs. Quick, her previous married name. She was the only Hawaiian language teacher at Kamehameha Schools when she started teaching there in 1966. By the time she retired, 37 years later, there were 10 full-time Hawaiian language teachers and a mandatory Hawaiian studies curriculum. I spoke with Sarah Keahi in 2015. My grandmother spoke Hawaiian with my mom sometimes, and I was fascinated because, you know, I, I would talk to my grandmother a lot, ask her zillions of questions, and I, and I, I really did want to, to, you know, learn Hawaiian. And it wasn't until I went to the university that, you know, I saw Hawaiian 101, I'm gonna take this, but my mom spoke Hawaiian with my grandmother, and my dad spoke sometimes. And the only time they spoke Hawaiian is when they were scolding. Scolding? Scolding, like, but they would scold us. And you would know what it meant. And we knew all the, all the scolding, like, you know, Kuli kuli and you know, some of those things, but. What does kuli kuli mean? It's the not so nice way of saying be quiet. It's more like shut up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, so we knew those kinds of things. You were spoken to in Hawaiian as a way of scolding you, but it was also kind of a secret language too, among yeah, the adults. And well, yes, cause like when friends would come over or my grandmother would talk with her friends, it was all in Hawaiian, you know? And it was the adult language. Yeah. They never really sat down and taught you anything because that's not how they do it, mm -hmm. you know? If you're interested, you would sit down and listen. But it wasn't until I was in college and when I started studying Hawaiian and then, you know, I think 
the day when I could understand my grandmother was just like, oh, yes, you know. She was a Manaleo. She, yes, she, she was a so, Manaleo. And you were learning textbook Hawaiian. Right. But I had my grandmother to practice with. I was really fortunate because when I was um, in, at the university, um, I worked in the recording lab at the Muse British, uh, Bishop Museum and with Eleanor Williamson who was like my second mom to me. And Ellie worked with Kavena Pukui, and they went on the road and they interviewed native informants. So I got to go. And Kavena wanted to interview my grandmother because she knew my grandmother. They were in the Royal Society together. And she said, I haven't seen grandma for a long time. I think we should, I should go interview her. So I went with them up to my grandmother's house and did the interview. And so on the way back to the museum, Kavena said to me, you know, you know, Grandma used so many words I haven't heard for so long. You know, it's so nice to hear those words again. I said, they're probably archaic, right? <laughs> Only you native speakers know those words. And, um, you know, my grandmother was a really fascinating woman because she was born when Kalakaua was king. And she lived through the provisional government. She lived through the, the republic the territory and 10 years into statehood. Was there a Hawaiian major when you entered no, the UH? No, in fact, I had to go see the dean. It was Dr. Albert who actually um, encouraged me to, to consider Hawaiian. This is Samuel Albert. Yes, Sam who Albert. Wrote, co wrote the Hawaiian dictionary. Yes, and everything else. And he taught you your first Hawaiian language class? Mm -hmm. He called me up one day after class and he said, Now, what, what do you want to do when you, when you um, in college? I said, well, you know, Dr. Albert, I'm going to be a teacher. He said, oh, my kai, my kai. And I said, he said, well, do you know what kind? I said, well, I'm thinking English. He looked at me, he said, English? <laughs> English? He said, he said, what about Hawaiian? And I said, Hawaiian? There were no schools teaching Hawaiian, you know. It seemed like bum advice because yeah, you couldn't get I'm a the, job. Dr. Albert, <laughs> but there's no, nobody that I know except the university. And he looked at me. And he said, there will be a day. Mm. And I was like, and he just looked at me, there will be a day. And he was right. And he was right. When it was time to student teach, teach I got this call from a um, Donald Mitchell from Kamehameha School. And he said, um, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And I said, oh, really? And he said, I uh, would like to, I know you're going to be ready for student teaching next year, and I would like for you to come to Kamehameha and student teach. I said, really? Wow. I said, I'm already assigned to Farrington, you know, with Marion Leloy. And he said, yes, I know. And I talked with the university people, and they said, if it's OK with you, it's fine. So I got to student teach with Dr. Mitchell, and that was just transformative. What was there of Hawaiian language at Kamehameha when you went there, I think, in 1966? Yes nothing. We proposed to a requirement in Hawaiian culture and history for years, seven years I think it took. Nothing happened, nothing happened. Then the Hawaiian community, you know, got involved in it. But I think when they did a graduate survey and the graduates said, the five-year graduate survey, that they were deficient. The school prepared them well for math and science and other, but they were totally deficient when it came to um, anything Hawaiian, and as they were in college in the mainland and people would ask them questions, they couldn't answer them intelligently. Like, where do the Hawaiians come from? Or could you say something, could you speak your language, or do you, is there a language? Or, I mean, they were embarrassed. So the graduates said that they were really deficient, and, and finally they, the requirement materialized. The name of our next guest was Marvin Nogelmeyer when he arrived in Hawaii from Minnesota on what was supposed to be a stopover on his way to Japan. He ended up staying and is known today as Dr. Puakea Nogelmeyer. He's a Hawaiian language scholar, UH professor emeritus, and executive director of Awaya Ulu, an organization that bridges Hawaiian knowledge from past to present to future. He didn't grow up knowing anything about Hawaiian culture, let alone that a Hawaiian language even existed. After finishing high school and landing in Hawaii in 1970, 
he moved with friends to rural Makua Beach in West Oahu. During our 2009 conversation, he told us that while living and working at Makua, the late Kumuhula Mililani Allen invited him to join her halau. Mililani Allen taught the anti Mikey Ayu Lake method of hula. With dance, in the Mikey school of dance, you have to do research and you have to do oh, tra attempt translation and you have to write notes for all your dances. You have to keep notebooks, there's quizzes. It's like an academy of dance, right? So we did that. So I started to learn um, language just sort of randomly. Then we started to learn chant. There was a project in 1975, 76 maybe, called the Mele Project and Keahi Allen and uh, what well, was the board she was on, they felt that chanting was going to go away because the only ones who knew it were elders and nobody was teaching it, it wasn't seen. So they set up to have Edith Kanaka'ole and Edith McKinsey teach chanting to young people, to you know people that are involved in halau. <coughs> and on Maui, I think they got Hoku Padilla to do it. So anyway, these classes start up. I end up in a class. That's fascinating stuff. The chants, they come from everywhere. Some of them are really ancient. Some of them are more recent. That's what led me into language. And there's, there's actually, there's an epiphany that happens because I have a good short-term memory. So I could look at a chant and memorize it. And under pressure, I could keep that for a while, you know, so we could memorize these things. And um, I'd have to memorize the Hawaiian and then memorize the English to make sense out of it, you know, and get these. The payback for these classes was we had to do presentations. You had to go out to schools and whatnot, make it a living practice kind of thing. So we did a presentation, and it might have been at McKinley, I don't remember. This old gentleman walks up to me and talks to me in Hawaiian. And I was stunned. <laughs> I said, oh, sorry, Uncle, I don't speak Hawaiian. And he looked a little crestfallen and he, you know, he said, well, but how can you understand what you're chanting? I said, well, I memorized the English. And it sounded dumb. You know, it still sounds a little <laughs> dumb. But um, and he says, but how can you tell how well you did? How can you tell how well you did? Yeah, are? this is, you know. Who was this man? Well, and I didn't know who he was, and now he walks away, and I thought, you're right, you know. And then I thought, right there, I just thought, you're right. Why would I engage if I'm not trying to learn what this is about? So then I started to try and learn Hawaiian language. Now, it's not, it's probably 10 years later that I realized who that old man is. It's Auntie Edith's husband, Luca. Yeah, mm -hmm. tall, handsome man. and. You know, I was so blown and intimidated, I never even asked, who are you? You know, <clears throat> excuse, so we started, we went back to Auntie Edith McKinsey, who was running our class with, Auntie Edith Kanaka'ole would come teach us, but Auntie Edith was the main run. So we want to learn some language. Well, she was a student herself, really. She wasn't a native speaker. Her mother spoke it, and her grandmother, so she had a good handle, but she'd gone to classes. But she says, well, I'll teach you what I know. So we started with a class on her back porch. I mean, I wasn't in school or anything. This is just, you do these things because you're interested. And then I met Mr. Kelsey, Theodore Kelsey, just kind of randomly. It was brought up to me June Gutmanis. She had written, she researched Hawaiian stuff, and she had written a number of books, Na Pule Kahiko, Kahuna La Aula Pa'au. She would assemble Hawaiian language material. And she could do that because she had this old gentleman living with her. He was 88, I think, when I met him. And he was fluent in Hawaiian. And he would help translate. You know, he would translate all her things and then she'd make sense out of it. So when I met him and I asked him, would, would you be able to teach Hawaiian? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, I'm not a teacher. He says, there's some books on that. <laughs> but with what Auntie Edith was doing, see, I'm a highly motivated, being in character. If, if I want something, I'll usually you know, figure out a way to try and make that happen. So I would take what Auntie Edith was teaching us, which was pretty simple Hawaiian, and I would talk to him when I went up to visit, and he'd talk back in Hawaiian. He wouldn't teach me Hawaiian, but he'd, 
he'd engage. You gotta imagine this, right? I'm, what am I then, 20 something? 20, 30, I'm 35 pounds less than I am sitting in front of you. So I'm this skinny little rail of a guy, hair down to here, very flippant, very, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pothead, I'm a silly guy, I'm fun, you know. And um, I can't imagine that I hit his spot as the perfect student. And it was after a few years that, you know, I mean, he knew I was seriously interested, but I, I had to be as alien to him as he was to me. Mr. Kelsey had become kind of a pivotal part of my life. He was like a window on another world. You know, he was an adult photographer at the funeral of Lili Uokalani. And after a couple of years, June had told me, she says, you know, Mr. Kelsey said something about he thinks you'll keep up his work. Oh, that's I just, a great I was so, well, and it was a, uh, I mean, it actually really touched me because I also thought, oh God, now, I, you know, now I'm on, in debt, sort of. I mean, now, now I have to be serious. Amy Khalili was born in Mobile, Alabama, around the time the Hawaiian Renaissance was starting. Her family moved to Hilo when she was eight, but it wasn't until she attended Kamehameha Schools in Honolulu that she started to feel a connection to her Hawaiian culture. Her mentors were those who had learned from the kupuna. At the time of our conversation in 2009, Amy Kalili was the executive director of Aha Punana Leo, the Hawaiian language immersion preschools. She also hosted a Hawaiian language segment on KGMB's morning news program. I was a boarder at Kamehameha for four years, um, and while I was there, I took a Hawaiian language course. More so because it was a requirement, you know, and it was that, or I think Japanese and Spanish at the time, and French, there weren't a lot of choices. So that was kind of my first exposure to Hawaiian language in terms of acquiring some kind of working knowledge of the language. Um, but after I graduated from Kamehameha, I went away for a year. I went to a, a small college in California in Orange County. And I came home and went to UH Hilo. And I had a bunch of friends who were actually friends who I had taken language with at Kamehameha who were taking language at UH Hilo. And it was more like, oh, you got to come take Olalo. It's so fun. And, and, and UH Hilo was and is a hotbed of Hawaiian yes, language. Yes, definitely. Didn't UH Hilo provide the first uh, MA in Hawaiian language? Yes, specific um, directly relevant to Hawaiian language and literature, yes. So, yeah, I was really fortunate to um, end up there, I guess you could say, and to have the opportunity to continue my language learning there. I had some wonderful mentors. Um, one thing that really helped was I was able to get a job while I was in college. While I was at UH Hilo, I worked in the Hawaiian Language Center at UH Hilo. And having those venues where you can actually apply your language learning instead of just keeping it confined to 50 minutes a day as a language course, I think that's what really helped me acquire my fluency. So you're a professional storyteller. <laughs> I mean, who would ever have thought that this little girl that grew up in Mobile, Alabama would somehow get back to Hawaii, get involved with the Hawaiian language movement, and then be arguably, as you said, the first person who's been given an opportunity to report on stories in the Hawaiian community in our own Hawaiian language. We had a crew that flew down up from Maori TV from New Zealand um, to do a story on us for one of their news programs. What the Maori people of Aotearoa have been able to do with Maori TV. For me, that, that's a goal. It's a goal to shoot for. It may, definitely wouldn't be the end all be all, but having content that covers the gamut from news, drama, comedy, um, documentaries, having all of these things being done in the Hawaiian language from a Hawaiian perspective, I don't see any reason why we can't get there. You know, the financial resources to do so are always going to be an obstacle, but, you know, it's something that we'll overcome. And just finding the right people, growing a cadre of people who have the skill and who have the perspective to um, make it happen, I think is, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity that's out there on the horizon, and we just got to keep moving closer to it day by day, one two-minute story at a time. <laughs> Today, she continues to be an advocate for the Hawaiian language. Mahalo to Amy Kalili, Puakea Nogelmeyer, Sarah Keahi, and Larry Kimura for having shared their stories with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha nui. There were still people in the late 70s and 80s. There was, you know, that's when they started to predict language death. Mm -hmm. 
the main age of, um, or the median age of language speakers was, they were in their 70s. There were very few children outside of the Nihau community. So they said 10, 15 years, there will be no speakers left. Well, that's where the language revitalization that kicked up from the 70s has just, it's never lost its drive. It's never lost its momentum. It's still, you know, extending and growing. That has kept me entertained for three decades. You know, ever since it, um, I launched into language, there's been a dynamic force moving forward. So. That's right, and how many people now speak the Hawaiian language fluently, do you think? Oh, different levels of fluency. I mean, there's, you know, a lot to discuss. Enough to carry on there. their life at home, how's that? But there are people, there might be, I might estimate 10,000 people today who can work with Hawaiian language, who have different levels of fluency where they can utilize Hawaiian language, either as a uh, conversational tool or as a writing or reading or listening tool. You know, it's a usable level of it. And probably twice that, that have at least an insight into it. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org.